Hello and greetings everyone. Uh, we are very grateful for the moment that God has given us to share this time together in the study of his word. We are continuing with our studies on the sanctuary that Brother Sami had just uh, been going through for the last 18 parts, and this is probably the 19th part that is trying to answer some of the questions that sort of uh, rose from our previous studies. And today we are studying Matthew chapter 25. But before we study Matthew chapter 25, why don't we pray? And then get uh, uh, and then get started. Our Father and our God in heaven, I'm so thankful. Thankful for your grace and for the opportunity. As you want to study your word, may it not be I myself seen, but Christ and Him crucified. Put your words in my lips one more time. Lord, speak to your churches through this vessel and let us hear what it is that you're trying to say to us in this end of this world's history. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, um, brothers and sisters, I want to uh, share uh, my screen there. And if you look at my screen, um that's exactly uh what is studying today today we are studying uh about matthew chapter 25 re-examined uh, in other words uh, i have renamed that study wake up join the procession now this is a very common study among us Adventists and even various Christian uh, groups, denominations, movements. And so it won't be entirely new, but it's proper for us to revisit it. Why I'm saying it is being re-examined is not because I'm having any new light. It's all about going through what is revealed in the word of God and putting the pieces together and seeing what it is that God perhaps intended that we should be able to see or find from that beautiful text. So wake up, join the procession. Um, I want to straight away uh, uh, go with us to that slide and why this portion, why this quote here? you'll understand when we get to the end, God as a church. Because it's important for us to see in a basic sense what God defines the church to be. If we have an understanding of that, and I'll be reading a lot of quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy, because we've set the background for this series in the Word of God, the Bible, which is our creed. And so we are substantiating what we have been able to read from the Bible and believed with what is said through the inspired writings of Sister White. God as a church, what is it? It's not. So Ellen White begins by saying what the church is not so that we can be able to do elimination tests, what the church is not. It is not the great cathedral, neither is it a national establishment. Um, Neither is it the various denomination, it is the people. So she says the church is the people who love God. So that definition is very important when we'll be going through some other quotes and Bible verses that actually um, will help us understand better Matthew chapter 25. Um, it is the people who love God and keep his commandment. Now, when you study, you'll find out that the Sunday Adams movement are a people who are identified by a banner. And that banner had the inscription that those who keep the commandments of God 
and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Our identifying mark, the three angels' message, is that there are people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Right. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I'm in the midst of them. Where Christ is, even among the humble people, this is Christ's church. Um, for the presence of the high, this is a very important statement, and the Holy One who inhabited eternity can then the word alone, I should have made that bold and perhaps read, alone constitute the church. So that will help us to understand better what constitutes the church. The church of God is constituted where the presence of the I and the lofty one dwelleth alone. So when the presence of Christ is um, eliminated from a place, the place ceases to be a congregation for God. So why are you bringing this in Matthew chapter 25? Let's continue reading. Where two or three are present who love and obey the commandments of God, Jesus there presides. And Christ in us, or as the sanctuary was built so that it might show, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. The presence of the sanctuary was the presence of God. Why? Because the sanctuary announces the presence of God. The gospel in the sanctuary is learning about Christ and his father. So where the sanctuary is, where the sanctuary is studied, where the sanctuary is part of our lives, uh, there the presence of God is. So there Jesus presides. Let it be in the desolate place of the earth, in the wilderness, in the city, or enclosed in prison walls. The glory of God has penetrated the prison walls, flooding with glorious beams the heavenly light in the darkest dungeons. His saints may suffer, but their suffering will, like the apostles of old, spread their faith and win souls to Christ and glorify his holy name. The bitterest opposition expressed by those who hate God. God's great moral standard of righteousness should not and will not shake the steadfast soul that trusts in God. We are told, and this is important in Matthew chapter 25, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. This parable has been and will be in the future. So there are the two parts that this parable will be, or rather has been, and will be fulfilled to the very end of time, the very letter. For it has a special application to this time, and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present through to the close of time, so is this parable. Yes, so this parable was fulfilled in the passing of time in 1844, and or rather 1840 to 1844, and will be fulfilled again to the very time of the close of probation. Ellen White says emphatically in the book, Great Controversy, the parable of the 10 virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people referring here, if you read in context, to their experience in 1844. Here in context, She's not referring to their experience just before probation closes, or rather around the time that cycles the passing of the National Sunday Law. Even though the parable prophetically having double application will also refer to this time, here Ellen White writing in 393 refers to the experience of the seventh month movement during the time of the great disappointment. Read in context. All right. We are told in manuscript release, volume 16, 19, um, uh, 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 269, 270, she says the parable of the 10 virgins was given by Christ himself. And every specification, and that is what I want to pick, every specification. 
Have we studied every specification of the parable of the 10 virgins? Yes, no. And we want to study a particular uh, a specification in that parable that perhaps has gone without being studied or without being presented. It's not something entirely new, but will make sense to you. And so I am inviting you to carefully investigate these things with me. We are told a time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say we are wise or we are foolish. So I cannot say I am the wise person or the foolish person. Listen to the statement again. We are represented either by the wise or the foolish virgin. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say, just like you cannot say with authority that I am part of the 144,000, but I will do everything in God's word that God would have me do to be part of that number by his grace, right? But I cannot pride myself and exalt myself that I am part of, I am the 144,000, but I pray and languish with God, labor in prayer that God may give me the grace to be part of the 140 and 4,000, right? There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and those appear outwardly like the wise. All right. Now, again, she says the review and herald, October 31st, 1899, same statement said in another language, every specification of this parable should be carefully studied. We are represented by who? Either the wise or by the foolish. There are many who will not remain at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. They have not the knowledge of his ways. They are not prepared for his coming. The oil is the holy grace that is sent from heaven. And there must be an inward adorning with that grace if we would stand when he appears. And that grace which is here presented is sent to us in Steps to Christ, pages number 52, that that grace is the Holy Spirit that that grace is the oil that is emptied to us, page 53 of the same book, Steps of Christ, through the ministry of holy angels. Right? Look at this statement. The work of God on earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every reformation or religious movement. So there is a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principle of God's dealing with men are ever the same. There is no new thing under the earth. What has been is that which shall be. So the past history of God's people, the important movements of the present have their parallels in those of the past. And so by studying those things which have been in the past, we are putting on a binocular that will help us to see what it is that will come in the near future or at our present time. So how do I learn what will come? I study the history of what is past. And so we have nothing to fear for the future except we choose today to neglect those things which have been in the past. God's leading of his people in their past history, says the prophet. And the experience of the church in former ages as lessons of great value to our own time. There is nothing that is new. So let's look at Matthew chapter 25, because Matthew chapter 25, we told about the two, uh, the wise and the foolish, waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. I will read this just for our, um, uh, uh, for us to be able to, uh, uh, Speak on this, and here we go. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, listen to this, and then uh, we delve into more of those quotes and see uh, what the word of God says. And then we connect it with chapter number 20, 18 of uh, Revelation. The kingdom of God is likened unto ten virgins which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom, right? And then we are told 
And five were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lambs and took no oil. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And then we are told, while they all slumbered and slept, at midnight there was a cry. That verse is what you are going to investigate today. That every specification of the parable should be studied. So why don't we study that verse at midnight and we look at the midnight of the world today when there is great apostasy, when there is a moving away from the truth, when the purpose is making inroads into the movement that God established in the passing of time in 1844, then all, uh, uh, the, the old bridegroom cometh going out to meet him, then all those virgins arose. All the virgins arose at hearing the word. They all arose. In other words, they were all asleep. That, that's important to see. And they trimmed their lamps. They. So there is the aspect of variety there, meaning they all trim their lamp. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil for our lamps are gone out. So in the process, the lamps are uh, of the uh, foolish, uh, they couldn't get, they couldn't trim their lamps uh, and be able to join the procession because they had no oil. And the foolish said unto the wise, uh, give us oil. For our lamps are gone, but the wise answer saying, not so lest there be not enough for us. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they went. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Let's stop there and investigate a few things about this parable, isn't it? But now when you look at this parable, uh, really interesting uh, who is here presented? Isn't this an, uh, a nice um, thing to investigate? Yes. We are told all the Christian world, and I remember uh, our brother uh, was able to go through this, Rosami. All the Christian world is represented in this parable. The bride constitutes the church who is waiting for the same uh, uh, I want to hear me. What's the difference? The difference is this. All the Christian world is represented in this parable, but then she says, the bride constitutes the church who is waiting for the second appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Question. Is the bride part of the virgins? No. If you look at the common weddings that you have, we have the maids and we have the bride. The bride is the woman being married to the bridegroom, all right? But the maids are the female gender people, those who come to escort the bride during the marriage ceremony. So here we are told all the Christian world is represented in this parable. Then she says the bride, remember she didn't say, the wise and the foolish virgins, or the virgins, she says, the bride constitutes the church that is waiting for the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So there is the virgins and there is the bride. If you read your Bible, you won't be able to read the word bride in chapter 25. But the question should be, how can there be a marriage where we have a groom without a bride? That should be your question. We are seeing virgins, the wise and the foolish, but we are not seeing the bride. But I think the Bible intelligently, when Jesus gives the parable, he gives the parables which are a reality. 
He's basically describing what is a typical Jewish customary marriage. And it is known by those who are listening to Jesus that that marriage must have virgins for the brides uh, or, or the maids, must have the bride and must have the bridegroom because it was a reality. Now, some who have a nominal faith are not prepared for his coming. The oil of grace is not feeding their love. And they are not prepared to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Their representation is such as to call forth our understanding that we may know what preparation uh, we who are living in the last days are to make, that we may enter in and partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I have come to believe that this parable has been fulfilled for a very long time in Christian history. But in specific sense, when being quoted by Ellen White, it is in reference to what happened in 1844 and what will happen in the end of time just before probation closes. But in principle, it does not mean that this parable had never been fulfilled in principle, even during the Jewish time. What are you saying, Brother Zadok? Look at this slide here. The 10 virgins are watching in the evening of the earth's history. She applies it apocalyptically, uh, prophetically, all claim to be Christians. So you see, again, she says all are claiming to be Christians. All have a call, all have a name, all have a lamb, and all profess to be doing God's service. How many people claim to be Christians in the world? How many people have a name? They call themselves Christians. They have the word of God. They have the Bible. They are reading the Bible. They are also claiming that we are supporting our beliefs by the Bible. And all profess to be doing God's service. They are all saying we are doing God's service, including chapter 16 of the book of John, where he says they will even kill you and kick you out of the synagogue, professing that they are doing God a service. All apparently wait for Christ appearing. How many people do you walk outside here, go to churches, and, and you hear them saying that they're looking forward to the soon return of Jesus Christ? Could be more than just Adventists. And that's the reality. But five will be found surprised, dismayed, outside the banquet hall. They will be found out. Now, what does mean, this mean? Look at this statement. It's very important because it might not be getting clearer as time goes. Uh, rather, it might be getting clearer as time goes, I pray. Many who heard the first and the second angel's message, now she refers to this parable in the time when actually there is a crossing over from the disappointment. The first and the second angel's messages, uh, those who heard those messages first preached, 1840 to 1844, thought they would live to see the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Had all who claimed to believe the truth acted their part as wise virgins. Pause, because this is important. If they had all who believed the truth acted their part as wise virgin, the message would air this have been proclaimed to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. In other words, they all didn't act they are part as wise virgins. Look at this, friends of Jesus. But five were wise and five were foolish. The truth should have been proclaimed by the ten virgins. God was willing that the ten virgins proclaim the truth. The whole Protestant movement that came into America and were in Europe and in Africa, God looked forward to them as a unit proclaiming the truth. The 10 virgins, it was God's will, they proclaimed the truth, but only five, listen carefully, had made the provision essential to join that company. Pause. So there is a company to be joined. Five made a decision to join the company. Let me stop there so that you see what I'm saying. 
So five of them made the decision to join the campaign. So there were 10, but only five made the decision to join the campaign. So there is another group. It's, it's a company. You see, five made the decision to join the campaign. All right. Let's go back to the quotation uh, after that demonstration and, and see what's there. Only five made the decision uh, and made the provisions essential. There were provisions that were essential to join that company who walked in the light that had come to them. So there was the company, if you now look off from the slide, now look at my image, the top corner. That was the company and that company, that particular company, was joined by the wise virgin. But that company, how was it made? It was made by those who had walked in the light that had come to them. The third angel's message was needed. The proclamation was to be made. Many went forth to meet the bridegroom under the message of the first and the second angel's message. Refused the third angel's message. They had the first and the second, they rejected the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. Right. Uh, well, look at this. It's important for you to think about this. Foolish virgins, Laodicea. The state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as Laodicean state. The seventh church. And in Laodicea, where is Jesus? Jesus is outside Laodicea. What is the gospel? What's the mystery of the gospel? Christ in us, the hope of glory. So the presence of Christ inside us, listen to me carefully, that is our hope to glorification. When Jesus prayed, fill thou me with Thy glory, the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. How do we receive that glory that Jesus had? Because Revelation 18 says, the earth was laid or filled with the glory of the angel that descended. How do we receive that glory of the Father given to Jesus Christ through the angels to bring to us? The presence of Christ inside us. Christ must dwell in us. Our hope to translation, our hope to sing Jesus is not a denominational name. It is not certain few lines of doctrines that we hold right. It's right we have to believe in biblical doctrines, but they have to bring Christ inside us. The first angel's message is calling us to fear God and give him glory. How can a group that does not have the presence of Christ, where Christ is outside and knocking and pleading to come in, be able to be glorified or be translated as without wrinkle and without spot? That is not possible unless they repent. All right? So the state of the church presented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the laudation state. So the foolish virgins that not have the indwelling of Jesus Christ, the life, the power, the transforming power of Jesus Christ, they might have the letter of the word, they might have their lamps, but they do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Christ is not dwelling in them by faith. So you have to see that. So the foolish virgins do not have the indwelling of Christ. They don't know the character, the image of Jesus Christ. It is all Christ object lesson 69 that Jesus is waiting for, the Father is waiting for, and then the revelation of the character of Jesus Christ, and then he will send his son. If the church of God becomes lukewarm, where is that? Revelation chapter 3. 
Revelation chapter 3. If the church becomes lukewarm, if the church becomes Laodicea, it does not stand in favor with God anymore than do the churches that are represented as having fallen and become the habitations of the devils and hold of every false spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful body. If the church becomes Laodicea, it does not stand in favor with God anymore than do the churches that are represented as having fallen. So you talk of Pergamos, for example, you know, of those churches that persecuted the people of God in the East of seven churches, Laodicea is not any different. If it becomes lukewarm and refuses to repent, what is the only hope for Laodicea? They have to repent and they have to go back to that agape love of the Philadelphia. All right. How many groups are here? Two distinct entities are represented here. Look at what happens. Lingering near the bride's house are 10 young women robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil. All are anxiously waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. Mark those words. The virgins are anxiously awaiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. But they, there is a delay. There is a delay. Hours after outer hour passes, the watchers become weary and fall asleep. How many of them have fallen asleep? The foolish and the wise, right? At midnight, the cry is heard. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Look at this, the sleepers. So there is a cry that is made. Who makes this cry? Here's the question. We already seen the bridegroom is categorically mentioned. But is the bridegroom here without the bride? That's the question we need to be asking ourselves. The sleepers suddenly awaking spring to their feet. They see, listen carefully, brethren, now. They see the procession moving on. Who is in the procession? We are not going to deal with the bridegroom. It's, a, it's sort of a common denominator. The bridegroom is already mentioned. So who else is in the procession? Bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice, listen carefully, friends, so that we investigate the Bible in a way that is, uh, uh, well, I mean, we let the scripture, the testimonies explain themselves, but here she says, bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of who? The bride. So if, who is they? They here is the sleeping virgin. So they there is not the bride. So the bride, if I would pictorially express that, the bride is not the virgin. That's what I understand. Who is Christ coming from? Revelation chapter 19, the bride. Who is the bride? Because you told Christ, it, the sound is heard, of the bride, voice of the bride, and of the bridegroom, the ten maidens seize, look at that, they seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth. But five have neglected uh, their flask with oil. They did not anticipate so long a delay and they have not prepared for the emergence. There must be a preparation for an emergence. In distress, they appeal to their wives and companions saying, give us your oil for our lamps are going out. But the waiting five with their fleshly trimmed lamps have emptied their flagons. They have no oil to spare and they answer not so, lest the oil not be enough for us and you, but you rather go to them that sell and buy for yourself. Who is the bride? Ellen White says in letter 136, 1902, the church, is the bride. Ephesians chapter 5 says Christ is coming for the church represented by a woman that is without spot, without crease, without wrinkles. The church is the bride, the lamb's wife. Right. She should keep herself pure, sanctified, holy. 
Never should she indulge in any foolishness, for she is the bride of a king. Yet she does not realize her exalted position. If she understood this, she would be all glorious within. Look at the midnight cry and see how she applies uh, that particular uh, verse or chapter. Then I heard the voice. This is 1840 to 1844. Of another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. A light shone upon the desponding ones. And with ardent desires for his appearing, they again fix their eyes where? Upon Jesus. I saw a number of angels conversing with the one who cried, Babylon is fallen. That's the second angel. And this united with him in the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Pause. So, there in the passing of time, uh, let me explain for you this. You need to see me again. This is what is happening. In the passing of time in 1844, there were those who were crying, Babylon is fallen. Of course, you know, angels came and empowered them, human beings who had surrendered their lives as ministers. And they're the ones who are saying, they were preaching the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. So then this group that was preaching the second angel's message, united with the group that was saying, beyond the bridegroom cometh, the angels that were preaching, beyond the bridegroom cometh, going out and meet him. Here we are. I saw a number of angels conversing with the one who had cried, Babylon is fallen, and this united with him in the cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh, going out to meet him. The, the musical voice of this angel seemed to reach everywhere, an exceedingly bright and glorious light shone around those who had cherished the light, which had been imparted to them. Their faces shone with excellent glory, and they united with the angels in the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. As they harmoniously raised their cry among the different companies, those who rejected the light pushed them and with angry looks scorned and derided them. But angels of God wafted their wings over the persecuted ones while Satan and his angels were seeking to press their darkness around them to lead them to reject the light from heaven. So you'll see this in a little while. If you look at the next slide here, then I had the voice saying to those who had been pushed and derided, come out from among them and touch not the un unclean. In obedience to this voice, this will help you understand the parable now. A large number broke cords which had bound them, leaving the company. Now that number that broke the cords that had bound them, that is what is called the wise virgins. And leaving the company that were in darkness, the foolish virgins, joined those who previously, they are those who had previously gained the freedom. So they are those who are in darkness and those who are receiving the light and breaking off from the darkness and joining another separate group who had previously gained their freedom and joyfully united their voice with them. Three groups. And we have to come out from that darkness. Those who come out from that darkness are the wise virgins who stream their lungs. They hear the word of God. They cite the word of God to prove if it is so. And they look by the word of God, even if it means cutting links with their loved ones, with their loved denominations, with their loved ministers, with their loved uh, theology. I had the voice of honest agonizing prayer from a few who still remained with the companies that were in darkness. The ministers and the leading men were passing around in different companies, fastening the courts more firmly. But still I had this voice of honest prayer. Then I saw those who had been praying, reaching out their arms for help towards the united company who are free, rejoicing in God. So there is a group that is reaching their arms for help towards the united company who are free again, rejoicing in God. So as they reach their arms, what happens? The answer from them as they honestly look to heaven, 
and pointed up and was come out from among them and be separate, I saw individuals struggling for freedom and at last they broke the cords that bound them. They resisted the efforts which were made to fasten the cords tighter and refused to eat the repeated assertions, God is with us, we have the truth. They broke off from that bondage. They broke off from that purple system of Isaac. They broke off from the strings that uh, 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 bound them to that darkness and they joined the company. This group that is lifting their eyes heavenwards, praying and seeking for God's light, studying God's word and hearing, come out of our my people. And they are coming out and joining the group that is faithful in truth. Remember, they are not joining just a denomination. They are joining a movement. They are joining the bride. They are becoming part of the bride. Uh, they are becoming part of the true church uh, that is without wrinkle. They are being united with those who are seeking for perfection of Christian character. Well, it's written, while these calamities were witnessed among the nations of the earth, another scene was presented. What scene? A great reformatory movement among God's people. She said, I have been deeply impressed by the scenes that have recently passed before me in the night seasons. There seemed to be a great movement, a great revival going forward in many places. Our people are moving into line. They are responding to the call of God. God calls upon those who are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to lead out in a work of thorough reformation. I see a crisis before us and the Lord calls for his laborers to come into life. Every soul should now stand in a position of deeper, truer consecration to God than during the years that have passed. Do not the scriptures call for a more pure and holy word than we have seen before. So that great reformatory movement, which here we are told in that great reformatory movement, the night representation passed before me of a great reformatory movement among God's people. Many were praising God. The sick were being healed. The great medical missionary work and the revival of Isaiah chapter 58. Miracles were being wrought of conversion of souls. Hundreds and thousands were seen doing what? Visiting families. You need to see the blueprint of the work that closes the history of this work. There is the medical missionary work. There is the healing of the sick. There is the healing of those who are, the, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, who hearts are broken. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families, opening before them the word of God, door to door. The relief work will be done with literatures and pamphlets. All right, hearts were convicted of the power of the Holy Spirit and the spirit of genuine. Mark, mark this, it's not about excitement. The final work here, we are told, hearts were convicted by the word and power of the Holy Spirit, a spirit of genuine conversion was manifested. On every side, doors were thrown open for the proclamation of the truth. The world seemed to be lightened with the heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the true and the humble people of God. At this time, a time of overwhelming iniquity, a new life coming from the source of all life is to take possession of those who have the love of God in their heart. Now, we are told in great controversy, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the world with his glory. This is actually the angel of Revelation 18. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in uh, 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 which has been witnessed in any not been witnessed in any land since the reformation of the 1600th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel's message. So as that procession, the people of God, when God gave the message to Miller, 
Men accepted the message. They studied the word. When they studied the word, they accepted the truth that Jesus, well, there was a, a, a time frame for Jesus, I mean, um, a time frame for something to happen. And that was the time that Jesus entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. They missed in the event. And after missing in the event, out of the 50,000, 49,950 people left the movement and backslided. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 39. God says, I am not of them that grow back unto the perdition all, but I'm them that all unto the saving of their souls. So the 50 L, faithful to their faith, they restarted the Bible, they trimmed their lamps, and in this trying moment, what happened? They joined the heavenly angels who were educating them. When they joined a heavenly angels, Hebrews chapter 12 talks to us about the heavenly temple, the church of God in heaven, which has the angels and which has the saints that we ourselves are not able to name. But God knows them by name, those who have been converted and are by faith being part of that group. Miller, uh, rather not Miller, I'm sorry for that. Ellen White and all the other friends who are looking through the message of the third angel were able to find out that something was happening in the sanctuary above. Jesus was entering into the most holy place to begin the final work of investigative judgment. So when they looked into that and they found that the 50 proclaimed the message and by 1863, there were 3000 plus strong seven day Adventists who had believed in the second apartment ministry of Jesus Christ and the antitypical day of atonement that Jesus Christ was ideally in the final phase of his work in the sanctuary. So those who are breaking off from that cord of deception became the wise virgin and joined this procession. And as time is passing by, people are either making decisions to join the procession or leave and go back to perdition or to break off and join the holy angels of God that refuse to join the procession of Satan, but join the procession of the father and his son. These holy angels are the ones we are to unite with today. So the question is, are you uniting with the holy angels that refuse to follow the government of Sodom? They are part of the heavenly church. And those who are uniting with them must desist from following the methods of Satan and listening to his deceptions. And so are you uniting with the holy angels who have decided to follow the father and the son or are you following the evil angels who have decided to follow Satan? If you become part of the holy angels that have followed faithfully the works of Jesus Christ, then you are becoming part of the procession that goes to the world and says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And then the wise virgins will hear that voice from any part of the world. They can hear that voice from a Catholic church. They can hear that voice as Muslims. They can hear that voice from the streets, having never entered any denomination. They will hear that voice when the National Sunday law is passed and there is no any organized denomination. And they will join that faithful group. And that is why when I look at Matthew chapter 25, I see more than just one denomination. Rather, I see a worldwide movement that is a people who have let the word of God be the foundation of their faith. And by that word, they have been transformed. So the word is not just a letter to them. It's a transformatory message to them. The third angel's message, the angel of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with great power, the Lord will work through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be consecrated, not by the unction of the Holy Spirit, rather not by qualified by the unction of the Holy Spirit, but not by the training of literal institution. 
So these workers are not going to be like, they've gone to theology schools, they've been to Andres, they've been to Okud, they've been to Spicer. They, they, no, it will be, have they had a upper room experience with Jesus, All right? Uh, let's wind up this as, uh, as we just bring this to a close. Um, uh, the shaking, uh, we know about this, but this is important. I saw some with strong and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenance were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of it, internal struggles. Do we have this experience? Well, it's those who cry and sigh for the abominations that are done in Israel that will receive the seal of God. While the world is waiting for the fulfillment of what is happening in Vatican, and how the Pope is moving from Vatican to Sudan and to Congo, you know better than I do, and I love prophecy. But what the world is waiting for is a demonstration from God's people of the true character of Jesus Christ. And the reason why the angels are holding the four winds of the earth, chapter seven of the book of Revelation, is not for the purpose to do anything. It's that God's people may be seen. So I want you to understand, angels are holding purposely for me and for you. The angels are holding purposely so that we might receive the image of Jesus Christ and of the Father in our forehead. That's purposely why they are holding. They are not holding for any of these things not to happen. They are not holding so that I may complete my degree. They are not holding so that I may have a family. They are not holding so that I might amass wealth. They are not holding so that we might have all these things that the world is looking for, the sleekest car, the best home. The angels are holding so that me and you can receive the seal of God in our foreheads. That is why there is chapter 7 there. They are holding because of you and me. And we have not yet come to a point where we are ready to receive the seal. Uh, as the praying ones continued with their prayer and as Christ, at times a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenance. Some I saw did not participate in the work of agonizing and pleading. And this is where the problem is. And if we don't do that, we cannot be wise virgins. Wise virgins participate in that pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. Those are foolish virgins. They were not resisting the darkness that was around them and it shut them in like thick clouds. The angels of God left this and went to the aid of the honest praying ones. I saw angels hasten to the assistance of all who are struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. And some of these people today might not even be keeping the seventh day Sabbath. They are struggling to know the truth. They are searching the truth in their closets. They are searching the truths under the tree. And when the angels will, they're trying to break off from that error. And I can tell you one thing. Angels are going to save them and bring them straight to the end of that final movement. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves and they lost sight. I, I lost sight of them. Let's finalize this. Those three angels let both tears and wheat grow together until the others. Then it is the angels that do the work of the separation. How do they separate? By the truth. And they are separated. Um, uh, the three angels of Revelation, they represent the people who accept the light of God's message and go forth as his agents to sound the warning throughout the length and the breadth of, uh, of the earth. I want to read something here, which is... Um, Interesting. Um, uh, three minutes and we'll be done. Matthew 25 and Revelation chapter 18. A similar work, Ellen White says, will be accomplished when that other angel represented in Revelation 18 gives his message. The first, the second, and the third angel's message will be repeated the call will be given to the church. Come out of our my people, that you be not partakers of our sin and that you receive not our plagues. 
um, she says this, in all the fallen churches, God has a people. All the fallen churches, God has a people. His call to them is come out of her, my people. This means, what does it mean to come out of her? Renunciation of falsehood framed by the enemy, which must be faithfully delineated by the servants of God, so they preach an end time truth, that humble, that the humble in art may hear and understand. Look at this. Continuing with the same statement, Ellen White now says, take each verse of chapter, this chapter, chapter 18, and read it carefully, especially, she says, the last two verses. And the light of a candle shall shine no more in thee, she quotes the verse. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. So there's a time that that voice will cease to sound in Babylon. Right? The probation of Babylon closes. Or rather the people in Babylon. If they it cease to be in Babylon. For thy merchants were great men of the earth. For by their sorceries were all nations deceived, by their pharmacare, care, by their deceptive medication. All nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that was slain upon the earth. How interesting is this? That when she connects chapter 25 and chapter number 18, it's interesting that she says, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. That means they will run out of that oil and they will be foolish virgins. They will be lukewarm. They will be Babylon, right? And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall no longer be heard in thee. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet her, but they don't have the oil, so that means they will be closed out, and they will never hear anymore the voice of the bridegroom. So there is a connection between the glory that fills the earth and the experience of the wise virgin when they join the procession, right? The great apostasy will develop into darkness, deep as midnight, impenetrable as sack of air, to God's people it will. Be a, uh, be a night of trials, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for truth's sake, but out of the night of darkness, God's people will shine. Last two uh, slides. The parable of the ten virgins is given to represent the church. Those who are watching for their Lord's appearing, those who are seeking most earnestly to be among that number, who will be acknowledged as the lamb's wife. So yes, we want to be wise virgins who will be become the lamb's wife. So we have to join that procession to become the lamb's wife. And how do we join that procession? By being wise virgins. So we can now not say that we are in the procession. We can only plead with God that we are wise virgins and we will study the word of God whenever light comes to us. And if we receive that word of God, we will break forth from the bondage and join that group that will sound the loud cry and have the upper room experience of the end of time. Pentecost repeated. They all made effort to keep awake, but they ceased to speak often to each other. There's a foolish virgin. And when they call came, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet it. It was unexpected. And we are told by the word of God, strive to be among the 140 and 4,000. That great reformatory movement we read about, we are told it required a desperate struggle for those who would be faithful to stand firm against the deception and abominations which were disguised in sacerdotal garments and introduced into the church. The Bible was not accepted as a standard of faith. Doctrine of religious freedom was termed as heresy, and its upholders were hated and proscribed. And so God is telling us, strive with all your strength 
will be among the 100 and the 40 and 4,000. Wake up, trim your lamps, study the word of God, join the procession. So what is our work? One minute. Our work is to have a connection with Jesus Christ, the holy oil. Let's accept it. Let Jesus Christ through the ministry of angels empty that oil in us. Help us to study the Bible and know his will. If we faithfully do that, we pray, we have devotion, we have study of God's word, we have meditation, we have service to humanity and to God, and we live with a pure conscience that we are not violating the principles of God that have been made plain to us, then we can look forward by faith to being part of God's final movement, the procession that finishes the work. I want to be part of that procession, but I'm asking God today, give me the ability, the strength to devote myself, to study your word, to pray every day and every single hour, to seek your will and have the indwelling of Christ in my life. If I do all that, have no guile in my mouth, be a virgin and follow not after the hallowed woman, and follow the lamb with us wherever I go, then I am doing what is called striving to be part of the final group, the 144,000. So yes, I cannot say I'm part of the 144,000, but I can say that our, my work is to strive to be part of that number. God bless you, and let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, hear thou us, gracious Father. Our prayer tonight, give us that eyesight to see that it's not sufficient to be virgins. For if there was not that ministry of the procession, how would we wake up to the eminent return of the bridegroom? We are thankful that there is a group that will shout and wake us out of spiritual slumber, doctrinal slumber. Lord, may that voice sound in my life and in our life today to wake us out of the errors that we are still cherishing that we may join the procession. This is our prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. God bless you. May the third angel's message lead you to the most holy place. Amen.